listening to the Vinnie Vitti Vici Show. I'm Patrick Henry Hansen, your Praetorian historian, your historical oracle, where every week I share real stories about real people and real events that has real relevance to your career and income. History that informs and inspires, educates and entertains. Because only those who look backwards truly understand how to move forward. That's why history matters. Why history is always relevant, always in style. And why a page of history is worth a volume of logic. You know, if our minds are weapons, knowledge is its ammunition. So welcome to our historical quest for knowledge, to weaponize our minds, to master life's most important skills, because not all skills are created equal. Some are created more equal than others, to quote Animal Farm. And like a gift from the past to your future, history has identified the three most valuable skills known to man. A trio of professional skills more valuable than a college degree, more powerful than a family name, and more meaningful than a fancy title. Because every job, every title, and every career is advanced and enhanced with this same skill trio of persuasion, negotiation, and communication. So join us each week in our quest to master these skills and achieve business, sales, and negotiation victory with history. Vini Vini Vici. After suffering crushing defeats in New York and New Jersey in the summer of 1776, Washington's army was in trouble, big trouble. The British Empire had launched the largest naval invasion in British history. Over 400 warships carrying 35,000 redcoats, they landed in New York Harbor unopposed. After weeks of small skirmishes and embarrassing retreats, the two armies finally faced off on Long Island, New York. In the only full-scale battle of the entire Revolutionary War, where the Americans were decimated. In one fell swoop, Washington lost almost 20,000 of his 25,000 troops. What initially looked like a calculated risk ended up being a colossal mistake, a mistake Washington never made again. In his first and only full-scale campaign, Washington didn't just lose Brooklyn, New York City, Manhattan, White Plains, and the Jersey Palisades. He lost the bulk of his army, including some of his best leaders, skilled fighters, devoted patriots, and competent spies, men like Nathan Hale, an American soldier and spy who, when captured, and just prior to being hung publicly, defiantly proclaimed, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. My God, that actually happened. By early December, Washington was down to just 3,800 men, 3,800 men without enough food, winter supplies, or even gunpowder. 3,800 men desperate to return home to their families. And most critical of all, 3,800 men whose contracts expired on December 31st. Washington's situation was hopeless. With the bulk of his army captured or killed, his remaining troops ill-fed, ill-supplied, constantly cold, homesick, demoralized, and outnumbered at this point, almost 10 men to one, Washington was tasked with taking on the largest, wealthiest, most dominant fighting force in the world at the time, and if that's not enough, do it in the midst of the coldest winter in American history, what today we call the Little Ice Age. A winter so cold, it became more deadly than the Redcoats, picking off Washington's troops with frostbite, starvation, disease and desertion. Hopeless, overwhelmed, and personally demoralized, it's easy to envision George Washington offering up this prayer. Washington needed a miracle, and what he did next shocked the world. Now Washington knew that without a victory, a decisive victory, he would lose not just his army, but the war. So starving, freezing, exhausted and outnumbered, Washington led his remaining soldiers on the most daring raid in American history, a surprise attack on British redcoats at Trenton, New Jersey. But these weren't just your average redcoats. These were Hessians, German mercenaries, contract K-2 
killers, professional soldiers, the Navy SEALs of the British Army hired to intimidate, expand, and enforce the largest, wealthiest empire in the history of the world, the British Empire. The Hessian commander at Trenton, Colonel Johann Rahl, was hosting a Christmas party the evening of December 25th, 1776. To him, it was inconceivable that the starving, freezing, outnumbered Americans would mount an attack on their Hessian stronghold, especially on Christmas Day, and especially given the dire state of affairs the Americans were in. Colonel Rawl was gleefully aware of the wretched condition of the American troops. And as a full-time German mercenary, a professional soldier, the colonel had a very low opinion of the American army in general and outright contempt for the American militia. He very openly dismissed the notion that the Americans posed any threat to the Hessians, mockingly calling them clodhoppers. <laughs> and that must have really put them in their place, those clodhoppers. <laughs> well, late that evening on Christmas Day, a local farmer and a British sympathizer knocked on the door of the Hessian headquarters and requested to speak with Colonel Rawl. Unwilling to step away from the evening's Christmas festivities, the man was refused. So the farmer handed a note to a servant and instructed him to get it to Colonel Rawl. The servant did as instructed and delivered the note. But the Colonel was in the middle of a raucous card game and didn't want to be interrupted. So he took the note and stuffed it in his vest pocket and continued with his card game. At that exact moment, Christmas night, December 25th, 1776, in heavy snow and freezing sleet, Washington led the tattered remnants of his remaining troops across the Delaware River. His men were in wretched shape, decimated by previous battles, worn out and ill-fed. The exhausted men negotiated through the floating glaciers of ice as they rode across the Delaware. The huge chunks of ice made the Delaware almost impassable. This famous 1851 painting you're looking at is largely accurate. During the Little Ice Age, it was so cold that the Delaware River would frequently almost entirely freeze over. It was so cold that Washington reported to his commanders the horrifying news that two of their men literally froze to death before reaching the other bank and could not be revived. As they prepared for their nine mile trek to Trenton, Washington was painfully aware that the fate of the nation rested on the outcome of his attack. Fortunately, he was a man up for the task and he wasn't alone. Aboard that fateful crossing were fellow revolutionaries, future president James Monroe, future chief justice John Marshall, future secretary of the treasury, Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton's nemesis and executioner, future vice president under Thomas Jefferson, Aaron Burr. But perhaps the most notable member of Washington's motley crew that fateful night was Thomas Paine, giant intellect of a man who was also acutely aware of the fragility of the American situation and the psyche of the American soldiers. Earlier that week on a cold night at an army campfire and on the backside of a drumhead, Thomas Paine penned one of the most quoted paragraphs in human history. He called it the American crisis. When Washington read Paine's words, he was so inspired, he was so moved by the words in his pamphlet that he instructed, he ordered all of his officers to read out loud at each campfire, Thomas Paine's crisis. So, on the evening of December 23rd, the eve of Christmas Eve, as the Hessians gathered around warm fireplaces in wealthy, commandeered American homes and celebrated Christmas German style, festively drinking spicy warm beer, reading letters, reciting poetry, and singing Christmas carols, across the Delaware River, Juxtaposed to the German revelries and Christmas merriments, on the cold and barren military grounds of the Continental Army, 3,800 American soldiers gathered around campfires and listened to the words of Thomas Paine fill the dark and rigid air with cause and reason 
and filled the hearts of men with hope and passion. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and praise of man and woman. For tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. And heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods. It is the madness of folly to expect mercy from those who have refused to do justice. And even mercy, where conquest is the object, is only a trick of war. The cunning of the fox is as murderous as the violence of the wolf. We ought to guard equally against both. Tis the business of little minds to shrink. But he whose heart is firm and whose conscience approves his conduct will pursue his principles to death. Without adequate food or winter clothing, these men began their nine mile march to Trenton, fueled by the adrenaline generated from the inspirational words of Thomas Paine, unwavering even when frostbite kicked in. Locals noted that their trail could be tracked the next morning from their cracked and bloody feet. The road to Trenton was literally marked with blood. At daybreak on the morning of December 26th, Washington reached Trenton and attacked. Freezing and with most of their gunpowder too wet to fire, Washington's troops were forced to use swords, knives, and bayonets in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Fierce fighting ensued, and the Hessians lived up to their reputation. They were big, they were strong, they were tough, they were skilled, courageous soldiers. But they were slowly pushed back, and eventually overwhelmed by the fighting ferocity and determination of Washington's troops. You see, the Americans were armed with something the Hessians were not. Something much more powerful than gold, galleys or guns. They were armed with a passion that was fueled by the love of country and devotion to the cause of justice and liberty. The Americans inflicted hundreds of casualties and over a thousand Hessians were captured. And the largest professional army in the world that day felt the sting of an American victory, America's first victory. I'm guessing this was the first time that King George III felt the cold chill of defeat run up his tyrannical spine. The Hessian commander, Colonel Rawl, fought bravely, but was hit with multiple gunshots. As his surgeons cut away his uniform to treat his wounds, a note fell from his vest pocket. It was a message from the local farmer and British sympathizer warning of Washington's impending attack. Had he read the note, he would have easily repelled, defeated Washington in what would have undoubtedly become America's last and final battle. The Battle of Trenton wasn't the largest battle of the American Revolution, but it was the most important. And it was fought for the same idea and the same ideal as every American battle. An ideal so profound, it's been memorialized in the annals of history, what became known as America's political trifecta of life, liberty, and property. Those three unalienable rights are enshrined in our founding documents and woven into the fabric of the American dream. An American ethos to live life to its fullest, to live free and to own property, a right previously reserved for monarchs and their minions. You see, prior to the American Revolution, property was largely the domain of royalty, aristocrats, government officials, a watered down version of feudalism that separated serfs and servants, peasants and proletariats, from the elite upper class, the privileged few, the lords of the manor, the bourgeoisie. What made the American Revolution so profoundly unique was that it shattered the barriers that prevented people from exercising their inalienable rights and experiencing the American dream. In other words, it leveled the playing field. It established a foundation for each American to exercise our inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property. The American triumph right, the foundation of the American dream. Now I know most of you are asking yourselves or saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, Patrick, 
is it life, liberty, and property? Or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? And the answer is yes. It's both. Both terms were used synonymously by Thomas Jefferson, and the Founding Fathers used them interchangeably. Jefferson was fearful that he would be accused of plagiarism if he used John Locke's famous quote, life, liberty, property, verbatim. So he substituted property with the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence. What's fascinating is that they considered the terms synonymous, that property, the pursuit of property, the pursuit of wealth, and the pursuit of happiness all had virtually identical meanings, and they were right. Now, I come from a very patriotic family where my dad used to tell us that while Washington was the sword of the American Revolution and Jefferson the pen, it was Patrick Henry who was the heart and voice of the revolution. So they named me Patrick Henry Hansen after their favorite Revolutionary War hero, best known for his electrifying declaration of give me liberty or give me death. My parents taught me what a privilege it was to be named after such a great man, but more importantly, they taught me what a privilege it was to be born an American. In the Hansen family, the American dream wasn't just an opportunity, it was an obligation. I was taught at an early age that to truly live the American dream, to fulfill my destiny as an American, I should embrace all three, life, liberty, and property. I think that's true of every American. We should live life to its fullest. We should live free and we should take advantage of the economic and financial benefits available to us as Americans. And what happens? What happens when millions of people actually live the American dream? I mean, isn't it a limited pie? Isn't there only so much in a bucket to go around? When millions of Americans leverage the dream, is there less opportunity or more? Well, let's look at the facts, the evidence. Immediately following the American Revolution, the United States went from being the ugly stepchild of the British crown to becoming the richest, wealthiest nation in the history of the world. There's not even a, a close second. And what was the economic effect, the financial impact of the American Revolution? Well, it was nothing short of nuclear. I mean, not just on individuals, but on the aggregate, on the whole, the nation, the country. Americans generated enormous, unprecedented wealth. And why did this happen? Why did this happen? It happened because America found the secret sauce to building wealth. America found the economic elixir, the formula. America cracked the economic code. When you have millions of citizens willing and capable of maximizing their opportunities, you have a calculus for winning, for generating wealth on an unprecedented scale, both individually and collectively. That's why America is called a land of opportunity. Opportunity for what? Opportunity to build and generate wealth. And I'm going to argue that with the right skills, enormous wealth. You see, this is your chance. These are your opportunities. As an American, this is your birthright. But you have to choose it. You have to embrace it. The American dream is a choice. You have to choose to participate. And sadly, fewer and fewer Americans are making that choice. Instead of claiming their birthright, they're forfeiting it. They're rejecting the formula instead of embracing it. They're falling short of their financial potential instead of reaching it. Short of their financial dreams instead of fulfilling it. They're falling short of the American dream instead of living it. Our schooling system is terribly inefficient and ineffective. From kindergarten through college, they don't teach basic business acumen, uh, elemental financial literacy, or even fundamental communication skills. Our society is overschooled, undereducated, and woefully unprepared to take advantage of the opportunities the American dream and system affords us. Right from the start, Americans have not been taught They've not been equipped with the necessary skills to reach their financial career potential. And those necessary skills are, drum roll please, selling, negotiating, 
and communicating, or passion, I'm sorry, persuasion, communication, and negotiation if the word sales scares you, which by the way, it shouldn't. It, it absolutely shouldn't. And I know that there are some people, you've got a real prominent guy out there on the internet basically telling everybody that if you don't have his DNA, you can't sell. That if you're not this uh, ADD riddled personality that just goes 100 miles an hour, Mach 10, that uh, you know you just don't have the DNA for it. That's crap, it's ridiculous. It's, and in fact, it's, the harm that's done is probably staggering. Um, if you're someone who's a little more introvert rather than extrovert, um, there are some excellent books. I would recommend one called The Introvert's Edge on How to Sell. It may shock you, but the best sales reps are introverts. I've been doing sales training now for almost 20 years, and I can tell you the best salespeople are engineers. Engineers. Man, I'm going to digress if I get going on this too far. I'll, that's a whole other show, and I am going to do about 10 shows on that over the next year. Hugely important topic. But, uh, you know, if the word sales scares you, then just use the word persuasion, but it's the same thing. So persuasion, communication, negotiation, or sales, negotiation, communication. Um, these are the skills that are obviously important in business, but that are entirely ignored in our schooling system. In fact, it's worse than that. They're not just ignored, they're shunned. The word sales is right up there with like Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, and you know, kitty porn. I mean, to the pointy-headed, theoretician, academic, lifetime government worker professor, sales is a dirty word. It's beneath their integrity, their dignity, of course. But don't be fooled by those dressed in the robes of the false academic priesthood. These three skills are the gatekeeper to your success and are far more valuable than almost any college degree. I'm, I'm certain there are some exceptions here, probably with industry-specific work-related degrees. Uh, those might be, or maybe the institution. You have a degree from Harvard, regardless of what it's in, maybe that opens doors for you. But mastering these three skills can and will do more for your career, business, and financial situation than anything else, which is why I've trademarked them as inalienable, your inalienable skills. The same way you can't achieve the American dream without the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property, you cannot achieve the American dream without the inalienable skills of sales or persuasion, negotiation, and communication. Without the big three inalienable skills, you will not and cannot fully achieve your financial potential or the American dream, period. That's the real secret. The American dream is alive and well for those willing to do three very simple but very important things. Number one, choose a reputable, reasonable, and ethical career path. Preferably one that matches your natural gifts, your talents, your passions, maybe your personality. That could be an accountant, an engineer, a graphic designer, an entrepreneur. I mean, pick your poison. If you're unsure of what careers might be available to you, I have some advice for you. That is the go to salary.com and do some research. It's an amazing resource to find a career that you believe in, and uh, it'll give you all the financial averages of what people make and all of that, salary.com. And if you're still not sure after that, then try a few of them out. I mean, there are amazing career paths that people have no idea even exist. So number one, choose a reputable, reasonable, ethical career path. Number two, work hard, work really hard. Foundational. I mean, my rule of thumb, without exception, is to go to work 45 minutes early and to stay 45 minutes late, minimum. Regardless of what career you choose, it follows the Pareto principle. You need to be in the top 10 to 20% of the performers in whatever career path you choose, period. Foundational to that is work ethic, work ethos. My philosophy is I might not be able to always outsmart my comp competitors or colleagues, I might not be able to outwit them. Uh, they might have more talent than I have, but I will always outwork them. And so should you. Step three, develop the three inalienable skills. Persuasion, communication, and negotiation skills. These are the inalienables. In every industry, in every market, in every career, there's a direct correlation between the skill trifecta 
and your success and income. Without these three skills, you will remain forever in the 80%. With these three skills, you can advance and enhance your career and income. With these skills, it almost doesn't matter what career path you've chosen because there's always money at the top of every career path. And if you have these three skills, they're equally applicable in every single vertical, every niche, every market, every industry. Follow those three steps and you will see that the American dream is alive and well. Keep in mind, these aren't just business skills, they're life skills. Whether you're aware of it or not, and I'm guessing many of you might not be, but you are selling, negotiating, and communicating every hour of every day of your conscious life, at work and at home. I read a book recently that I strongly recommend. It's called To Sell is Human. It's a great book. And in it, the author points out that roughly one in 10 Americans are employed in sales. Well, so are the other nine, they just don't know it. Every job involves selling, negotiating, and communicating. Even those pointy-headed theoreticians, <laughs> S and C. I mean, what is an interview? What is an interview? I mean, right from the very beginning of your relationship with a company or a business or a corporation, what's an interview? An interview is selling, negotiating, and communicating, regardless of what job you're interviewing for. How about getting a raise? SNC, selling, negotiating, communicating. SNC, increasing your department budget if you're a manager. SNC, how about convincing your employees to work harder if you're a business owner? SNC, how about a doctor getting a, a patient to exercise more frequently? SNC, how about a teacher convincing their students that they should read more frequently? SNC. How about a parent persuading their teenage boy, uh, their 30 year old, to stop living in their basement and playing video games for 10 hours a day? SNC. Life is SNC. Life is selling, negotiating, and communicating. I mean, that's what parenting is. That's why it doesn't matter what career you choose as long as it's ethical and reasonable, uh, even what industry or vertical you work in. It doesn't even matter what business you start. If you're a greeter at Walmart, whether you're a you have a degree, an advanced degree, a GED, or no degree. From accountants to attorneys, engineers to entrepreneurs, whether you're a doctor, a teacher, an electrician, a lab worker, a lawyer, or a lawn mower. Historically, the three skills that you have to have to achieve the American dream always have been and always will be selling, negotiating, and communicating. Business and life's and alienable skills. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Hope you enjoyed the history of Washington's victory at Trenton. And of course, I hope you enjoyed our introduction of the big three inalienable skills of selling, negotiating, communicating. Join us on our next episode of Vini Vidi Vici, where I'll share another epic historical example and show you what lessons we can learn that have modern application. Thanks for joining us. My name is Patrick Henry Hansen your Praetorian historian, your historical oracle, guiding you to business, sales, and negotiation victory with history. And remember, my fellow entrepreneurial warriors, my sales Spartans, drive fast, take chances, and never forget that business is war, sales is the battlefield. Be Spartan. Let's do it again. Ariana messed it up. First Daisy, then Ariana. What are you gonna sit down there and stare at me the whole time? All right. What? Heck, man. Not me. Honey, I got like laser focus. Laser focus. The only thing to distract me is your naked mother. Disgusting. Mm -mm -mm. Got it on tape, baby. <laughs>